Good morning, church. Somebody going to answer that? Yeah, that's what we've been talking about in this series, right? How many of you know God calls, but we got to pick up the phone? Right, somebody? And let me just share this thought with you. Uh, we're going to wrap up our series today, but as we were singing that last song, Show Us Your Glory, that, that was a powerful song. And, and really, the thought that came to my mind was this. When we say, show us your glory, how many of you know that's bold? Because here's what happens. When God shows us his glory, we stop focusing on us. And we start focusing on him. Can I just tell you uh, the word that God had for me before we came out here today? And I love you, but the word for today is we need to grow up. Amen. That, that's the word that God has for us today. Uh, too many of us have been on the milk of God's word. And we haven't seen any change in our life. Or when we go through difficult times, we don't know how to respond. Because we act out of our flesh. We act out of our feelings. Come on, church. God wants us to go deeper. God wants us to grow up. And you know the way you grow up is stop focusing on you. And you focus on him. Because when you do that, your life will change. When you do that, circumstances around you will begin to change. God will begin to bring fruit out of your life. How many of you want to be fruitful? And you want to live the life that God's called you to do? How many of you want to walk in your calling and walk in your purpose? Well, we've got to stop focusing on us. And we've got to let God grow us up. I hope you receive that this morning. Because God wants to do work. But we've got to respond to it. We, we've got to open our hearts to it and say, God, that's for me. I listen. I, I, I receive that today. And, and so I, I want to wrap up our series today uh, talking about this idea today that sometimes our God-given purpose isn't immediately revealed. And I want us to focus on that for a minute today and talk about this today because unfortunately this is where a lot of people stop. I mean, they're excited about the idea of God having a plan and a purpose for their life. They're excited about how God has something specific for them to do, a specific job and task. But how many of you know that isn't immediately revealed to us? God reveals things to us a lot of times piece by piece, step by step. And what happens a lot of times is instead of us continuing to seek God, we decide to live in the place that was never meant to be our home. Come on, church. What we end up doing is we give up on our calling and we live a life that's just filled with regrets. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to get to the end of my life looking back over my life and saying, you know what, I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have done this. When God asked me to do this, I wish I would have stepped up and done that. I don't want to live a life of regrets. But I fear that that's where we're headed if we don't understand this fact today that sometimes God's purpose for our life isn't revealed immediately. But at the same time, I do want to tell you this today that God's calling us to more. How many of you know that? And you just sense that in your heart? You believe that today? He is. God's calling each of us to be a part of something that's bigger than us. God wants to use our life to build his kingdom. How many of you think that's exciting? Right? God has a specific plan for you and for me. And God has a plan and a purpose for our life. But yet, here's the difficult part. Sometimes, our purpose is revealed over time. And I want to tell you why today. I, I want to give you some factors to consider, some things to think about. Why sometimes we don't see the big picture right away. Why our, our purpose seems fuzzy sometimes. And I want to look at two guys today. Great examples of somebody who, who surrendered their all to God and did great things. But they were people like you and me. I just want to look quickly today at Moses. And then I also want to look at David today. So that's where we're going to go today. We're going to look at David and Moses. And we're going to answer this question. Why does discovering our purpose take time? 
You ready for this journey today? Amen. You, you ready to receive and be open today? I hope so. And, and I know that we're going to find ourselves in one of these places today. And let me just say this up front. Embrace it. Because some of these may sting. Some of these may really hit home. And we don't want to harden our heart to what God wants to do. I believe God wants to heal some things in our heart today. I believe God wants to heal some hurts. And to bring some clarity to where there's confusion. But we've got to receive it and be open to it, okay? Ready, church? Ready for this? All right. I think it's hard for us to discover our purpose. Number one, because of this, is going to come on the screen. I just want you to see it. We're insecure. And in case you're wondering what insecure means, I looked it up, so I guess the dictionary's got to be right. Here's what it said. Insecure means anxious, uncertain, not confident. So let me just ask you, we're, we're in a safe place today. Can we admit today that we're not always very confident? I mean, we try to act like it. We, we try to play the game, don't we, guys? But deep inside, we're not always very confident. Can we admit today that sometimes we are worried and anxious just about things, about life, situations? We are. Can we admit today that sometimes we don't know what to do? I mean, we, we want to plan, right? We want to look to the future. We want to have some, our, as they say, our ducks in a row. But sometimes you're still not very confident. You're still not very sure. How many of you still second guess your plan sometimes? We just don't always know what to do. And so we're not always very confident. And, and I want to tell us why. There, there's two things to understand about confidence. Number one is this. It's that confidence cannot be created. Another way of saying that is we cannot manufacture confidence. And even if we could, we could not maintain it. So let's talk about life for just a minute. That's why we go through stretches in life where sometimes we look in the mirror and we love ourselves. We like what we see. Yeah. Come on, we do this, right? There are stretches where we're confident in the plans we've made. I've made this plan, and I know it's going to work. I'm just confident in it. There are times where we just know where we're headed. But how many of you know we hit bumps in the road? How many of you know we hit some turbulence sometimes, right, church? And here's what happens when we try to create confidence. We come crashing down to earth. And instead of walking through life with confidence, here's what we do. We hide in our house. We eat a gallon of ice cream. And we just want to sleep. Come on, we do that. It's like we go through life and we can face it head on. But then we crash. And it's like, don't talk to me. Don't call me. Don't bother me. I, I just need to sulk or I need to do whatever. I'm just trying to cope, right? It's because we cannot create confidence. I think we know that, right? So here's what God wants us to understand. Confidence comes from our creator. You, you want to walk with boldness. You want to go through life with confidence, with your head held high. We have to have a personal relationship with God. Notice what Jesus said. These are amazing words to me, but in John 15, 5... He uses the analogy of the vine and the branches. And he tells his disciples, he says, I'm the vine, and you and me are what? We are the branches. And he says this, those who re remain in me, those who are connected to me, have surrendered their all to me. He says, well, they will produce what? Much fruit. Now these are amazing words, right? Think about these. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now let that sink in for a minute. Apart from God, we can do no thing. I think in some ways what Jesus was saying is that we can't maintain confidence. And if you think that life is all up to you, and you feel like you're in this all alone, you're not going to be very confident. 
Because how many of you know there are things in life that all of us face that are beyond us and above us? There are some things in life that we cannot fix them no matter how hard we want to and how hard we try. And Jesus is like, if, if you're not connected to me, you're not going to have confidence. I want you to have confidence. Isn't that good? And then Paul kind of echoes these words, says it in a different way. But Philippians 4.13, he says this, I can do everything, right? We believe that today. I can do everything, but now he says how? Through Christ who gives me strength. That sounds like a pretty confident person to me. I can do everything. I can face any situation that comes my way. I can hold my head up high constantly because Christ gives me confidence. Christ gives me strength. Christ gives me boldness. So let's look at Moses for just a minute because, as I said, he's a man. He was a man just like you and me. He did great things for God, but how many of you know he was insecure? He really was. And you see this at the burning bush experience. He walks over to the bush that's on fire. God begins to speak to him, and he reveals his plan for Moses. We know what that is, right? Lead the Hebrew people out of slavery in Egypt. That's what I'm calling you to do, Moses. Now, if you would, look at Exodus 3, verse 11, because we see Moses' response. And I wonder if we don't respond the same way. First of all, it says, but Moses did what? He protested. Come on, church. We ever protested with God before? I can't do this. Are you sure about this? You know who I am. This isn't, this isn't a good plan. This is cray cray. Whatever you want to say. We protest with God. Moses did that. But then notice what he says twice. He says, who am I? I? I can't do this, God. Look, he says, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? You want me to speak before Pharaoh, and I have a speaking problem. I have a stuttering problem. I can't talk to him. And then he says, who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? I mean, you're talking about a million people or more. I'm a single guy. How in the world can I do this job that you've asked me to do? Now, here's what I love about God. I think this should excite us and encourage us. God could have ignored Moses. When he protested, I, in my mind, I picture a fit. Now, if you're a parent like me, sometimes when your child throws a fit, you ignore him, don't you? They ever thrown a fit in the store and you just walk off? It's like, I'll see you later. I mean, God could have done that. He could have ignored Moses. But he answers him. He speaks to Moses. And I love these words. God says this, I will what? I will be with you. Now, here's what that says to you and me, though. Please lean in. We, we as followers of Jesus need to grasp this. We need to understand this statement right here. God's grace is the source of your security. Amen. Sometimes we are insecure and we go through life with just not feeling very confident. And here's the reason why, in a nutshell. Because we don't know who we belong to. Come on, church. I, I know we don't like to hear that. But a lot of us have grown up in church and we still don't know who we belong to. We, we, we don't understand God's grace because when you understand God's grace, it changes the way you live. When you understand God's grace, you can go through any situation with your head held high, full of boldness and confidence because you know who you belong to. And when we begin to accept the fact that God loves us, and the Bible says His grace is sufficient. And when we know in our heart that we belong to the Lord, our confidence should be sky high. Instead of going through life like this, with our head held down, we should walk in confidence. 
I belong to the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords. He's got a plan for my life, and I know that he is for me and not against me. That's confidence. And again, I like what Paul says. He says this in Romans 8. He says, if God is for us, if I'm connected to God and have this relationship with God, notice these confidence words. Who can ever be against me? Can we admit today that we feel like people are against us today? Wouldn't it be great to live like Paul? Said, if I know that I belong to him, then who can ever be against me? Who are you? Because I know who I belong to. But it's hard for us to walk in our calling, discover our purpose because we're insecure. Now let's look at David for a minute because here's the second reason I think it's hard for us to walk in our purpose. You ready for this one? It's because we feel forgotten. Not only are we insecure, but we feel like we are forgotten. And let's be real. Have you ever felt forgotten before? Anybody, right? When somebody doesn't treat you the way you think you should, they should treat you, guess what? You feel forgotten. You don't give a flying flip about me. You don't care, right? When you get passed over for that promotion that you've worked so hard and put in all those hours and gone above and beyond, and you get passed by, you feel forgotten. When your friends go out, and they don't invite you. And you see it on Twitter or Facebook. You feel forgotten. forgotten. How about this one? When you need God's help. But it hasn't come yet. <laughs> we feel forgotten. And, and David understands what it means to feel forgotten. Because if you're familiar with the story. You know that the first king of Israel was Saul. But he was disobeying God and leading the people away from God. And so God's like, I'm sorry that I ever made Saul king. I, I need to replace him. How many of you know we are replaceable? We need to know that. And so God says, I I'm going to call another king. Somebody that has a heart for me that's going to lead the people to the things that I have in store for them. So he calls the prophet Samuel to go to the house of Jesse. And he says to Samuel, you're going to find the next king of Israel at Jesse's house. And so what happens is Jesse brings all of David's brothers before the prophet to be considered for king. But guess what David was? He was out in the fields, guys. He was forgotten. And his daddy even admits it. Because Samuel says, you know what? God hasn't called any of these guys to be king. Are you sure you don't have somebody else? Do you have another son? And notice in 1 Samuel 16 what his dad says. David's dad says this. It says, in the same way all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord's not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked, are, they, are these all the sons you have? Here's his father. Well, now that you say that, they're still the youngest, but he's where? He's out in the fields, watching the sheep and goats. Samuel says, send for him at once. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. Now you can, you can uh, try to explain this any way you want to. But here's the fact. David was forgotten in the field. He was forgotten. But here's what you need to know about God. God still had a plan and a purpose for David's life. And some of us, we may find ourselves literally out in the field. We feel like people have passed us by. Opportunities have passed us by. Some of us may even feel like, God, I know you've called me to do this, but I just don't feel gifted. I don't feel like I have what it takes to do what you've asked me to do. Can I remind you today that you are valuable and you are purposed by God? And what I appreciate about Scripture so much is it's God's heart for you and me. 
And listen to God's heart through scripture today. Listen to how God feels about you today. Deuteronomy 31 says this, so be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid and do not panic before them for the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. How many of you know when you're walking your calling and your purpose, you have a heavenly escort? That God goes before you to make sure that his plan will come to pass. That's good news, right? But here's what God says. I will neither, neither fail you nor abandon you. I see you. I know where you are. You're not forgotten. You're not abandoned. And I've got a calling on your life. I like what Isaiah says, the prophet Isaiah. This is, this is an amazing scripture. Verse 15, the prophet says this, Never can a mother forget her nursing child. Can she feel no love for the child she has born? And he says this, But even if that were possible, I will not forget you, says the Lord. You ever felt forgotten before? You ever felt like people overlook you? I think we all have. But understand... God's promise. How many of you love God's promises? This, this is one that we need to hold on to. And it's the promise of, I will not forget you. I will not forget you. And some of us may think, well that sounds good, but how do I know that? I mean, what can I really stand on? And Paul writes these, these words in Romans chapter 8 because he talks about God's love. Because let's be honest, we've had people say they love us and they've walked out on us. We've had people say they loved us and they've trashed us and talked bad about us, right? We, we've experienced people just forgetting us for whatever reason. And here's what Paul writes, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? Verse 36, as the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. And people are thinking, God, have you forgotten about us? No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I'm convinced, talk about confidence, right? Boldness. I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed to us in Jesus Christ our Lord. We are not forgotten. And we are not insignificant. But when we don't understand that, walking in our purpose and calling is difficult, isn't it? And then understand this third idea why it takes time to discover our purpose. It's this thought right here. We think... That our story has been written. We think our story has been written. Come on. Can we, can we no longer as Christians walk into church thinking, i got to make sure that everybody knows my life's perfect. <laughs> like God forbid I come here and people know that I struggle with things and I need help with some things. Right? Let, let's stop playing that game. But that's how a lot of us feel. We're, we're experiencing some difficulties in life. We're experiencing some setbacks. Maybe things aren't going the way we thought they would go and the way they planned. We planned them to go. And here's how we feel. Well, I'm doomed. My story has been written. There's no hope for me. I guess I just have to accept the way things are. You, you ever been there, there before? I guess my situation isn't going to change. My story has been written. And understand, David could have felt that way. Because as we continue to look at his life, the prophet Samuel anoints him to be the next king of Israel. But don't miss this fact. 
Not long after David was anointed to be the king of Israel, his dad said, you got a job to do, son. Go back and be a shepherd. Say, what? I'm king. I don't know if he said this out loud. I'd be tempted to. I'd be like, dad, you know who you're talking to? You're talking to the king. I mean, you better wise up or I'll forget about you. I'll tax you, whatever, right? I mean, he could have felt that way because think about this. His, his current place didn't match his calling. Wait, I'm supposed to be king, but I'm in a field. I'm in, instead of in the palace, I'm in a pasture. I don't get this. This, this is wacky to me, God. But then you look at David's life, and we know this, that instead of him living in the castle, he ends up living in caves because King Saul's trying to kill him because he's jealous. He knows that he's appointed by God to be the next king of Israel, and Saul's trying to kill him. Can I tell you, that's where some of us are today. We feel like God's spoken to us. We feel like God has revealed part of his plan and purpose. But when you look at your life now, you're like, this doesn't match what I see. And David was there, but understand, it was by faith that, that David knew that, this, that his story had not been written yet. Do you know the Bible says that God's the author and the perfecter of our faith? Do you know who's writing your story? It's not you. And it's not me. It's God. And we need to understand that just because we're not where we thought we should be. Or we're not completely walking in what God has called us to. Does not mean that our story is over. David knew and understood that even though he wasn't king yet, God was preparing him. Because if you follow up on his life, his dad said to him one day, you know what, your brothers are in the army because we have conflict with the Philistines. Why don't you go and check up on your brothers? Bring them a lunch. See what's happening. And David shows up. And if we're familiar with the story, the Philistines had a champion warrior named Goliath who would go out every day for 40 days and taunt the people of God and say, instead of all of us dying, how about mano y mano? You send out your best warrior, we'll fight. Whoever wins, we'll be your servants. And the people of God were cowards. They were afraid. They wouldn't fight him. And David, the little shepherd boy, shows up and hears this Goliath talking smack, talking junk. And he's like, you're, you're blaspheming my God. I'm not going to tolerate this. I will fight him. And how many of you know news like that travels fast? And so King Saul finds out that this little boy David wants to fight Goliath. And he brings David before him. And here's part of David's conversation with Saul. He says, I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. When a lion and bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and I rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. He's a bad boy. <laughs> I've done this to both lions and bears. And think about confidence here. I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too. For he's defied the armies of the living God. The God who rescued me from the claws of the lion and bear will rescue me from this Philistine. So Paul, so Paul or Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, he said. And may the Lord be with you. I think Saul's kind of saying, you know what? Good luck. You're dead. <laughs> nice knowing you, son. I, I admire your confidence, but you're, you're, you're dog food. You're worm food, right? It's over for you. But I love David because he knew that God was preparing him for his calling. And that's where some of us need to rest in today. Though you may not be walking completely in your calling in the specific job that God's called you to, he's preparing you for it. He's sharpening some skills and bringing some experience and knowledge 
to your life. So never forget that God's preparing us. So let's ask the question, what's God preparing you for? What, what is he doing in your life? Because let's be real, sometimes the place where you work and the people that are around you, right, the situation you're in, it doesn't seem ideal. You're thinking, there's got to be more. I haven't arrived yet, right? This is all there is to life. And I want to encourage you, you may find yourself there, but don't stop making a difference. Don't just quit. Don't, don't lay down and let life pass you by. Just because things are difficult for you right now, that does not mean that God is done. That does not mean that your story has been written. Understand this. God can rescue you and God can use you. But sometimes we don't step into our calling and purpose because the situations we're in discourage us. And we think, you know what, God, it's hopeless. I'm never going to get there. My story's over. And then I think lastly, it's hard for us to discover our purpose sometimes because let, let's get even more real. If one of those didn't hit home, I know this will, is we compare ourselves to other people. We do, right, gang? And you see, David could have done that. Because as you continue to look at his story, Saul said, well, you know what, okay, you, you want to fight the giant, you need to wear some armor. You need to look like a warrior. You can't go out into the field with your staff and your sling and your little shepherd bag. So you know what David does? He tries on the armor and he realizes this doesn't fit. This isn't me. And this is so important. David knew that if he was going to do what God called him to do, defeat the Philistine, he had to be comfortable in his own skin. Come on, church. We can't try to be something or someone we're not. And we do that so often, don't we? Sometimes we despise the way that God's created us. And I love this quote. I think it's on the screen. If not, you might want to write this down. But it says this, Comparison is the enemy's way of telling you that God cheated you. Come on. That's how a lot of us feel if we're, if we're real today. We, we feel in our heart, you know what, God, you cheated me. I don't have the family like so-and-so. I don't have the job like so-and-so. I don't have the charisma like so-and-so. I don't have the talents like so-and-so. You cheated me. You robbed me. And that's what the enemy wants to do. Think, he wants to make us think that God's cheated us. And that he really isn't good. And let me tell you, the biggest culprit today of comparison is social media. And I wasn't going to say this, but I am. The root word for devil is diablo. And do you know what that means? Divider. And can I tell you, there is more division today than ever before... And it is because of social media. Because that's where the devil lives and that's where the devil operates. And we got too many Christians living there. Can I be bold today? And here's what we do. When we go on social media, regardless of how we feel, and we spew our crap and our junk, we're doing the devil's work. We're doing the devil's business. Some of the best thing that you could do is just get off social media. Because here's what it does. It divides, but then it also forces us to compare ourselves to other people. And do you know what happens when we compare ourselves to other people? It steals our joy. It stalls our progress. Comparison limits our potential. And do you know why social media too is, is kind of divisive it's because it makes things out to be perfect come on oh man look at their life it's 
perfect. Oh, look at their house. It's perfect. Oh, look at their vacation. It's perfect. Oh, look at their family. Aren't they cute? And all smiling. And don't they all look perfect? And can I tell you what perfection is? An illusion. It's an illusion. And so what we do is we go on social media and we get wrapped up in an illusion. Because let me tell you how people are. They don't want to reveal their true self to you. They only want to reveal the best parts of them. They don't tell us the whole story, right? That's the problem with comparison. You see somebody's highlight reel. Come on, church, right? And so what you see on social media, not only is that not the whole truth, but what people say on social media, that's not the whole truth either. Right. Amen. Oh, I'm helping you today. Amen. That's okay if you stare back at me like... <laughs> I'm helping. I'm talking to real life, right? So here's what you need to keep in mind. That... That perfect vacation picture. See, you don't know the real story. Maybe they were stuck in a hotel room for four days because the weather was nasty. And the one day they could get outside, it looks perfect. Right? How many of you know the picture of the perfect kids? Oh, they're so cute. They're all dressed alike. They're all smiling. 20 minutes before, they're biting each other, punching each other, kicking each other. Right? calling names is not perfect, right? The spouse. Oh, look at my spouse. Look at my husband. Look at my wife. Aren't they awesome? Look how beautiful all their clothing is. But you know what? Ten minutes before, you were cussing each other out and you were arguing about finances and everything else. Come on. You don't see the whole story. The picture of the perfect house. Oh, man, their room. That room looks amazing. What you don't see is that they were too tired the whole week to pick up their stuff. There were dishes in the sink and toys everywhere, and they cleaned it up five minutes before they took that picture. Come on, right? Listen to what Paul says. I love the Bible because it speaks to life today. And listen to what Paul says. And we're going to pray. 2 Corinthians 10. He says this. Don't worry. We wouldn't dare say that we were as wonderful as these other men who tell you how important they are. Now, notice what he says. They're only comparing themselves with each other. Using themselves as the standard of measurement. And notice these words. How ignorant how foolish is it for you and me to compare ourselves to people who are not perfect? It's foolish. And I love this quote. It says this, Human beings are works in progress that mistakenly think they're finished. <laughs> We're not finished. How many of you know there's more that God wants to do? He wants us to walk in our calling and walk in our purpose, right? We need to be secure in Christ. We, we need to know that we're not forgotten today. We need to know that our story is still being written. And guess what else? We need to stop trying to be like everybody else. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. But sometimes it isn't revealed immediately. Keep pressing in. Keep praying. Keep searching the scriptures. Keep a hunger and an openness to the things of God. Because his promises are yes and amen. And he promises to finish the work that he started in your life. How many of you know that includes the work he's called you to? He's faithful. But we need to keep pressing in. Would you stay? Hey, thanks for watching our message today. 
If you haven't already, be sure to click subscribe below so you'll be updated on the latest messages as they're loaded. You can also give us a thumbs up and let us know how we're doing in the comments section. Thanks again for watching us and have a great day.